Hello, YouTube. And after taking some time with the dive down recently on their podcast, we spoke briefly about Kaldheim. Now, normally I haven't really gone through many spoilers. In many cases, this is because Red Prison doesn't get usually a lot of things, maybe one or two cards that interest us. But let's go ahead and give it a shot. Let's talk about some of these. Many of you have asked, and I'm going to do some Red Prison things, but also some inspirational cards that you might find and maybe get to do something very interesting with. So let's begin. Toralf, God of Fury, and Toralf's Hammer. This is a modal dual-facing card featured in Kaldheim from Wizards. Now, what's interesting is Wizards has been recently printing some of these, expanding the design space of cards, and I think this one has some potential in Red Prison, albeit it's probably one of these options that you're just going to have to play with it and see if it really does use both sides of the card. Now, Toralf is no Hazard, it's definitely no Chandra either, and it's not indestructible, so it's susceptible to things like, say, Fatal Push or just damage. That being said, sometimes a 5-4 body at the 4 converted mana cost is just fine to get in and start beating down your opponents if you don't have an ensnaring bridge. So where does that leave us with the hammer portion, though? Well, the hammer portion is very interesting because in a matchup where you want bridge, we may be playing things like Season Pyromancer or Bonecrusher Giant. These enable us to have a creature on the battlefield which begins to interact with the Toralf's hammer. In this case, you can equip this for a cheap 2 mana. You can make your creature bigger, and you're good to go. Just slam in if you don't have the bridge. However, if bridge is in the way and you're not able to attack your opponent, you can unattach this and start dealing damage. This basically gives any creature a hazard-like ability for when you're maybe top decking a few too many lands. The other weird side effect that you might not have thought of is although 4 converted mana costs can sometimes be difficult for emptying our hands, in the case where we need a bridge down and need to start emptying our hand, say against spirits or humans, maybe merfolk or other creature-based strategies, you can actually cast Toroth's Hammer for the cheaper cost. This allows us to not get stuck with things that are at 4 converted mana cost and just get beaten down by little creatures. Toroth, God of Fury, Toroth's Hammer, definitely something to be said about these cards. Will they find their way into Red Prison? Maybe not, but they're definitely worth considering. Next up, we have Quakebringer, a 5 converted mana cause giant synergy creature that's also a 5-4, but can be cast for 4. This is interesting. This card actually caught a lot of our eyes at the very beginning of the spoiler season when it was spoiled. Now, why did it catch our eyes? Specifically, we definitely like your opponents can't gain any life. That's always a good thing to see on a red card, especially in some of the current meta. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes we've got everything locked down and we're just bashing away with damage from behind the bridge from, say, a Planeswalker or something like that. Well, Quakebringer actually can do that as well. Each upkeep, Quakebringer can do two damage. So how does it do this two damage, though? It needs to be on the battlefield. So if we have Quakebringer behind, say, a bridge, we're good to go. It's just going to lob two damage at our opponent. Now, what's to say that we don't have Quakebringer? Well, if Quakebringer is in the graveyard, maybe our opponent has gotten rid of Quakebringer by destroying it, we get the opportunity, if we control a giant, to also do two damage. Now, most builds of Red Prison are not flocking to a bunch of giants. In fact, most of Magic's history, giants are quite expensive if one fit in the modern meta where we're trying to be very optimized with our spells. However, a more recent giant has shown up and been played in several competitive versions of Red Prison, and that is Bone Crusher Giant. Bone Crusher Giant being able to stomp your opponent and then play it down with then Quakebringer's ability synergizing with the giant would be an excellent add for ways to beat your opponent from behind the bridge. If you don't have a bridge, the 5-4 body is definitely not bad either. So Quakebringer here, a foretell card from Kaldheim, and definitely something that's interested us as a way to help close out the game and get those final points of damage for Red Prison. Next up, we have three cards here that I'm presenting, and these are snow cards. All right, Weathered Runestone's just sitting in snow. The other two do have snow synergies. So let's talk about these and determine, do you need to be playing snow lands or can you stick with your favorite art basics? Tundra Fumeral has the ability to hit a creature or planeswalker 
And in this case, it actually hits them for four, which is actually really, really important for a lot of things. I see you out there, Dryad. What's not interesting is it's not like your angers and slag storms. It's not a board wipe for red. Red does do board wipes is usually at three damage per creature, and this doesn't quite do it. However, in a meta where there's not maybe as many creatures and you're needing to hit something a little bit larger, I see you, Channeler, I see you, you just might need that extra punch. Now, what's the snow synergy? Well, whatever snow mana that you use, you end up getting as colorless mana, and you get to use that till the end of the turn. So what does this mean? Well, you can play the Tundra Fumeral, and then you could potentially play, say, an Ensnaring Bridge if you use three snow mountains to pay for the Fumeral. Just an interesting add, allows us to potentially cast more than one spell a turn. In most cases, when we're casting a multiple spell, it's a ritual or exiling a Simeon Spirit Guide in order to play a card. So that's kind of an interesting one here. Does it get a lot of good points? I'm not really sure, but if we do need to kill X4 creatures or hit bigger planeswalkers, it could have a role. Faceless Haven is the next card. Now this is an interesting snow land. Typically our non-red lands are utility. We do have Ramionaut Ruins and we do have Scavenger Grounds along with Gemstone. Faceless Haven, though, is a little bit different than, say, adding a, a Muta Vault to your list. By paying three snow, Faceless Haven becomes a 4-3 creature with Vigilance and all creature types. So it actually benefits Rabble Master. Excellent. Do you remember another card it could be benefiting? Activate this, and you could be doing two damage with Quakebringer. All right, a bit much for two damage. But hey, it's an option. Faceless Haven just being that 4-3 creature though, that's a solid creature, and I like that option a bit better than say a Muta Vault. Muta Vault being a 2-2, yes it does pump our Rabble Master. Now the caveat here is that it is 3 mana versus something that's 1 or 2 on some of the other creature lands that you may be potentially running. So that downside to the side here, it's something that we could be playing. Cool little land. Maybe worth a try, maybe not. Give it a shot and let us know what you think. Finally, we have Weathered Runestone. The real reason I've put this in here is it's essentially like a Graft Digger's Cage. However, it's sitting at two converted mana costs, which is nice when we're playing Chalice. That's probably about all I have to say about this card. We have the matchups where we end up doing Chalice on one, and then we can't say do Pithy Needle or Graft Digger's Cage. And in this case, we would be able to play, say, Spyglass, or you would be able to play Weather Runestone. A little less cost efficient if you're playing Karn, and if you have, say, 5 mana. However, a nice way to typically dodge Chalice. Probably worth a shot here, and a cheaper alternative to Graft Digger's Cage with just as much potency. These are kind of your little extra cards here. Let's see what else we have in the list. The final card here for Red Prison is Tybalt's Trickery. This should come as no surprise as the counterspell in Red, and Red doesn't typically get these. Usually, Red's counterspells are preventing something from being countered or redirecting the counter. In this case, we just get to counter, which is pretty sweet. After all, it's at two. Blue Mages probably are very upset. Now, there is a downside to this one, that being said, some people are going to try to turn this downside into a big emrakul and smash people's faces, but let's not go there. Let's focus on how it affects Red Prison. Red Prison's strategy is to set up a lock with Blood Moon, Bridge, or maybe a Chalice, and you're just hoping that you can then win the game before your opponent perhaps finds the cards that they need to get out of the lock. Let's take, for example, our opponent has a basic planes, You've played a Blood Moon, and they're looking for a Celestial Perch. As we go, they finally do find this, and they play it. We end up doing Tybalt's Trickery. Now, we've decided to keep our lock piece in this case, but we're basically going to give them a free card. Now, what could that card be? Well, it could be just about anything. However, with our lock pieces out, it's very likely that that piece doesn't really matter. After all, my opponent was probably trying to find a few sideboard cards to get out of the lock that we've established. So 
With that, Tybalt's Trickery, yes, it may give our opponent something, but it's not going to allow them to resolve the thing that's getting them out of the lock. Definitely a card that I'm interested to see in. I love the randomness of this card as well. There's something very fun about just milling a few cards and then just seeing if your opponent wheels into something that breaks them out of the prison or makes the prison just stay on board. Tybalt's Trickery here. We'll see how this plays out. I do enjoy having a counterspell and a versatile counterspell. We'll see how we do with it. I'm sure we'll see some matches with it. Now, I know not everyone's here for Red Prison. Many of you have joined our channel in finding things like Vesperlark Reanimator, Blue Black Titan, and other interesting builds that we might have played in the past. And as always with a brand new set, this gives us the opportunity to look at some new cards. Let's go ahead and talk about a few of those cards that caught our eye and may have some ideas to build around. In Search of Greatness. Now this fits into the categories of Neoforms and Eldritch Evolutions, however it's a little bit different. We're not looking into the library, instead we're looking at hand. So you actually have to have the card in hand. What's interesting though is that with say 3 mana on the battlefield and you get a Questing Beast for free, you now freed up your mana to play something else along with this. Now, does the tempo play of playing this in search of greatness before stop, say, Green Stompy? Well, that would just have to be tested. What I also find interesting, though, is that yes, it's double green and difficult to cast. However, it doesn't say it must be green cards. We'll see how this one plays out as we go along. It may be a little bit too niche with being that it's from your hand. However, the downside of missing that it's not in your hand is a scry, and green, after all, would appreciate some card filtering from time to time. In search of greatness, we'll see if some people can cheat out some interesting things and get even bigger threats out for free. Next up, we have some sagas, and I've always enjoyed the saga since seeing the very first one, so I'm excited to see these back. I think they're a very nice and cool way to have a mechanic. They have some interesting things with being able to flicker them and then get to reset them, and they act a bit like a demonic pact in some ways, which is a pet card of ours. Now, they do go in order, so you have to be timely with what you want to be doing as each counter shows up on the saga. Let's talk about these two, though. They caught my eye, and they were kind of fun to see what the mechanics on them were doing. Raven's Warning is our first one. It's a blue and white saga here. Creates a 1-1 blue flying creature, specifically a bird, and it gains us a little bit of life. Then you get to attack with said bird or other flyers, and if you do connect with your opponent, you get to peek and draw a card. Great. Got a creature, gained a little bit of life, we get to draw, we got to see some information. It's pretty good all around little saga. The next part of it's really, really pretty sweet. If you got to see what your opponent has, you're going to get a chance to go to your sideboard briefly and put a card on top of your library. Now, sagas happen just after drawing, so you won't get to draw that card immediately unless you have, say, a cantrip. However, that card's ready for you next turn. A few things come to mind. Are you ready for this, Miracle folks? Ascent of the Worthy is our second one here. We have this card that doesn't do too, too much for its first and second counters, being that it chooses a creature we control, and until your next turn, other creatures basically do get to funnel their damage dealt to them to this creature instead. Now, if you want a creature to particularly die, then so be it, go for it, and there you go. You got to save your other creatures. Something that I would typically see in a little bit more red and white by that whole redirection and damage. Kind of a combat thing. The one part that was interesting here is, is on the third turn, so let's assume you get this out on turn two or three, you're going to be seeing this by, what it would it be, turn five, six. Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a flying counter. It's an angel warrior in addition to its other types. It's not a specific creature. It's not a creature of three converted mana cost or less. It's not X. It's not Y. This is just straight reanimate. Just reanimate a creature. 
And I really like this. There's an interesting note to this. Not a lot of reanimation spells are cheap like this, but this isn't cheap necessarily because it happens later in the game. But it's really cool to see that we get to just have a reanimation spell. It's pretty cheap gets whatever, brings it back, and your opponent knows that's gonna happen in a few turns. Kind of builds this tension in the game that I think Saga's uh, add, which is a really cool flavor piece to magic during the magic game. The art's really sweet on this one too. I, th I think I'm just a sucker for these sagas. Go check out all the sagas. Let us know which saga is your favorite. I'm sure there's a saga for each person out there. These two were the ones that I thought were most interesting to myself. We'll definitely be trying one of these, I'm sure, in some of our future matches. Next up, we have two Wrath effects here. We have a Doom Scar and Blood on the Snow. These aren't particularly inspirational, however, I would like to talk briefly about each of these. Doom Scar provides you the ability to foretell and get this down on turn two, exiled, and then turn three, Wrath your opponent's creatures. Now, typically, a Wrath at 3, like Bantu's, has a downside. This one's only downside is you would need to be doing this on turn 2 to hit it on curve. You can always future plan for this in the future by foretelling it and getting to play it a bit later as well, making it a cheaper Wrath, which is super nice. Doomscar, huh? Just a timing difference, but a pretty good Wrath. We'll see if it shows up, or if Wrath of God and Supreme Verdict remain the preferred Wrath effects. And don't forget about Damnation. Blood on the Snow is an interesting one. It's a very expensive card, but you want it to be expensive because it's extra side effect here. This card allows you to destroy either creatures or planeswalkers. You pick. All of them are going away. Goodbye creatures or goodbye planeswalkers, but based on how much snow you end up using, the snow will allow you to reanimate a creature or a Planeswalker, which is very interesting because sometimes in control matchups, you want to destroy all of their creatures, and then you could get back a Planeswalker. Interesting. Reanimating Planeswalkers? We've seen this before in a Saga type of effect. Now we're just on a spell, and a Wrath spell nonetheless. Blood on the Snow, Snow Synergy, Doomscar, Foretell Mechanics. Here's your Wraths for Kaldheim. We'll see the next card. Our final card here is a Sika God of the Tree, or more specifically, the Prismatic Bridge, a five converted mana cost card needing all colors, and reads that at the beginning of your upkeep, you reveal cards off the top of your library until you reveal a creature or a planeswalker, and then you get to put this into the battlefield. The rest of the cards go to the bottom of the library. This card is interesting because I think there's some deck building potential here to have, say, a super friends list that gets you an extra planeswalker each turn, could be a big creature, whatever it may be. I think finding a way to ramp yourself up to this card, be able to play it, and also be able to find it would be a great challenge, and then you get to wheel yourself into who knows what. The random nature of this is just as much fun as, say, an unexpected results list, but you could kind of tailor the list a little bit to hitting better unexpected results than the unexpected results list. Prismatic Bridge. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you for watching our look into Kaldheim cards. We talked a little bit about Red Prison cards and other cards that caught our eye, and there's many cards out there. Let us know in the comments which ones you've enjoyed and which ones you're most excited about playing and where you're planning to play these cards. As always, consider hitting that subscribe button to help support the channel and let us know what did you think about this non-league version of a video. Perhaps something we can do from time to time and talk about magic a little bit more from our perspective. Until next time, everyone, take care, have a good one, enjoy Kaldheim, and we'll see you in our next matches. Maybe, maybe it's just a next video.